Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our daily Dhamma session. Um, might be interesting for you all to know that the whole idea of doing a daily Dhamma talk, actually it's something I've just started, but I've done it before, and it comes out of our the, the setup at my teacher's monastery back when I was a young monk. Uh, every day, actually, morning and evening, uh, Jan Tong would, as long as he didn't have something else to do or somewhere else to be. He would come for morning chanting, evening chanting, and, and every day uh, would give a talk in the morning and in the evening, sometimes five minutes, sometimes ten minutes, sometimes longer. But every day he would give a little bit of Dhamma. It really created a sense of community and and uh, a sense of the, the of of being together in a monastery. So it, it made me think because uh, this is sort of what we're creating here, right? That we're all around the world, and we have meditators here at the monastery. And it's our one chance to come together. The meditators are off in their rooms meditating and everyone here is off living your lives. But uh, it's a lot like being together in the monastery, right? Every day we can do a meditation session together around 7 p.m., 8 p.m. And then at 9 p.m. we come together and just as though we were living together in a monastery, come together and listen to the Dhamma. carrying on this tradition, carrying on Buddhist tradition. The Buddhist tradition that I follow is um, well, it's fairly specific. We have what we call the Theravada, which mean, Thera means elder, Ovada or Vada means the teaching or the, the, the point of view or the doctrine. And by elders we mean this specific set of, of texts that have been handed down by a specific set of monks. Not all monks. Some monks don't follow these texts. We have texts that claim to be written by the... Uh, came to be uh, copies of what the Buddha actually said. We have texts that are explanations and extrapolations on those texts and then we have texts that are again extrapolations and explanations of those texts we have stories that are supposed to be stories the Buddha told or stories that recount events in the Buddha's life we've got the rules for monks we've got the talks that the Buddha gave we've got the Abhidhamma which is lists and lists and classifications of, of dhammas, of, of reality, really, of experience. So we have a cohesive tradition. This is Buddhist, Theravada Buddhist tradition. And also we have a meditation tradition. So the meditation that tradition that I teach is goes the way of the Mahasi Sayadaw and his teacher, the Mingun Sayadaw, Mingun Jetwan Sayadaw. It goes the way of Ajahn Tong, who I think personalized the teaching of it on his own. It's a specific tradition. We have again, this idea of tradition. But these two together, I think, make up the essence of 
of what the tradition would call Buddhism. We have in one of these ancient texts this this um, quote. Apparently, the Buddha said uh, he was asked by an old monk. It was an old monk who was concerned about being able to fulfill all of the duties because he had uh, become a monk in his old age. And so he asked the Buddha, uh, Kati Bhante Durani, how many, how many duties are there in this sasana? And the Buddha said, Dve me bhikkhu, Dve me bhikkhu Durani, Durani. Oh, oh monk, there are these two, there are only two, these two duties in this sasana, in this religion, in this teaching. Ganta turang, ganta turancha, vipassana turang. Or actually, a little bit, it goes in a little more detail, I can't remember the quote. So this is, comes in one of the commentaries, and some people might say, well, this isn't, this, how do we know this is actually something the Buddha said? It doesn't really matter. The point is, here we have a, a concise enumeration of the things we have to do. Only two things. It's often a question, maybe not a conscious question, but one in our minds. What does it mean to be Buddhist? especially when we come to practice uh, intensively. What are two things that we should do? Maybe we get the idea that there are many things we should be doing. We think of all the many teachings of the Buddha. What does it all boil down to? What do we have to do? So ganta dura, ganta dura. Ganta means uh, sort of gathering or something, or threads or something. Um, what it means is study. We have to spend some time in scholastic endeavor, studying the Buddhist teaching. And of course, vipassana dura, we know this is the duty or the task of trying to come to see clearly. So on the one hand, we have all this text, and we have the textual tradition that we have to follow. We have to carry on, in fact. And we have a meditation tradition where it's our duty and our task to practice to see clearly. And the, in, in our story with this old monk, he says to the Buddha, oh, I don't think I'll be able to practice uh, ganta dura, dura. I won't be able to study to, to completion. There's just so much. And here my memory is not good, I'm old. Uh, but, but vipassana dura, that's something I can do. Is it okay if I just stick to vipassana dura? And the Buddha was okay with that. It seems these two are not something that everyone has to do, that they are um, that which we as Buddhists have to carry on. So if no one were to carry on the texts and, and to study the texts, well, we would lose the path, we would lose the way to, uh, to become enlightened. And on the other hand, if we were to just focus on the texts and no one were to practice insight meditation, of course the texts would become useless and incomprehensible. We don't actually take the time to practice to gain insight. We're not likely to, the, the texts become meaningless. We're not likely to understand them in the future without people to verify and explain them from a practical perspective. So let's talk about these two because this the textual tradition and the meditative tradition. These are the two Buddhist traditions that we follow. So the textual tradition, we've got lots of teachings. We have 84,000 teachings by one estimation. 
this is what the texts themselves say they, that they contain. 84,000 teachings. Now, may, that may just be a euphemism or a simplification for a lot, because it seems 84,000 was a common number. But at any rate, we do have a lot. We've got the Vinaya Pitika, which is full of all the different rules and norms of behavior. Um, mostly things we shouldn't do, but a lot of prescriptive things as well that we should do. A way to act and speak and deport oneself properly as sort of a basis for the practice of meditation. And we have the Sutta Pitika, which is full of a lot of meditative teaching that describes all of the many talks that the Buddha gave. The Buddha was here and said this to this person, ways and means by which the Buddha uh, passed on his message and evoked proper um, inclination. So it wasn't just about passing on information, but the Sutta Pitaka is is full of inspiration and uh, adaptation of the teachings to suit particular audiences. What you get out of it is not just information, but you get a sense of the, the real feeling of being a meditator. And you get this encouragement from the Buddha and this shaping and molding of our minds by the ways the Buddha taught. And uh, adapted the teachings. So the great thing about studying all of these is, is that you get a broad idea of the different ways that the teaching can be presented and you're able to pick that which resonates with you and approach the teaching from different ways. And then we have the Abhidhamma Pitika which uh, really lays out the foundation for insight practice by not containing talks that the Buddha gave, but actually containing pure information. So giving a pure classification of the Dhammas that really allows, provides an actual precise road map. You know, the, the, the connections between good states and, and happiness and bad states and suffering. And the different connections of cause and effect and, and supportive causes and uh, hindering causes and so on and really the way things work together really gives a detailed analysis of reality and on the whole allows us or gives us a glimpse at the, the way we we should understand reality or, or sort of the paradigm we should undertake, and it, if, even if you don't understand the whole of the Abhidhamma. It's easy to th see through the Buddha's description of the various mind states and the qualities of mind and so on. That when we meet, when we speak of reality in Buddhism, what we mean is experience. What we mean is not time and space and the universe and the cosmos and the planets and the stars not even particles or subatomic particles, atoms, molecules. But what we mean is the physical and mental aspects of experience. So it gives us, again, this, not just information, but it helps us understand, provides a, a framework or a foundation for reality. But again, like this old monk, we can plead off, oh, studying all of this seems daunting. Now, for many of us, we do have the time. Many of us don't have the time. It's important to understand that this is not this is not the end of the Buddhist teaching. It's not enough to spend all of your time studying. And so, if that's all that you have time for, you've really missed the point of the teachings. So we have to adapt the teachings, and we can expand and contract the teachings. And it's like a it's like a hologram in some ways, I think. You can pick one part and you find the hole in that part. 
for example, the the, the three the three tipitaka, the three pitikas, you know, these in summary, these deal with sila, samadhi, and banya, morality, concentration, and wisdom. Right. So morality is the things that keep us uh, keep our our actions and our speech in check. It's those acts and and words that we should avoid or ways of avoiding gross uh, defilement you know, actions that we're going to regret and that are going to cause us stress and suffering same with speech that's basically what the Vinaya Pitaka does and what it's for why it was organized into that group the Sutta Pitaka mainly deals, when, when it boils, it's boiled down, it mainly deals with meditation or concentration or focus. It's about actual practice. It's practical. It, it has many methods and means by which the Buddha would help us to cultivate or help his audience to cultivate wholesome states and progress on the path. Samadhi, and the, th the Abhidhamma Pitika, of course, deals with pure wisdom. It mimics the understanding that a meditator gets through practice. It describes it, describes what wisdom is. You can't gain wisdom by reading the Abhidhamma, but you can, you can get a map, sort of an outline, a framework for what wisdom would look like which can be quite useful. Of course, all of this can get in the way if you study too much, then when you meditate you're just thinking, because thinking is a habit. Studying itself is a practice and it has consequences. But if you study just enough and in proportion with your practice, uh, it gives you this map, this framework to allow you to understand reality. And so. The Dipitaka really boils down to, to morality, concentration, and wisdom, which can then be expanded if you want to go to understand. Uh, it's expanded into the Eightfold Noble Path. The Eightfold Noble Path, we have right view and right thought, this is wisdom. Right speech, right action, right livelihood, this is, concentrate, uh, this is morality and right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. This is the concentration or the samadhi aspect. And each of those can then be expanded as well, and sometimes you just pick one and you can cultivate. Each one of them can become the, the essence of, of your practice. For example, right view is again the Four Noble Truths, which also contain the Eightfold Noble Path. Right mindfulness, of course, is the most common one. Because right mindfulness is the four foundations of mindfulness. And the four foundations of mindfulness again contain uh, all the other elements of the path, contain the Four Noble Truths, for example. Ultimately, if you're really lazy or, or in a hurry to become enlightened, you don't have to worry too much about study at all. In the commentary, the tradition, the texts themselves, the commentarial texts, talk about the, the canonical texts, and they say, uh, the entirety of the three pitikas can be summarized under one, one word, and that's apamadapada. The path of the path of apamada, which is vigilance or religions, uh, heedfulness, sometimes translated, which again just means to be mindful. And so our study, whether it be much or whether it be little, it comes down to this. It comes down to understanding and getting a sense of the right direction for our practice. As to vipassana dura, 
Well, vipassana is a word that probably doesn't need much introduction. Most of us are familiar with it, but our understanding may be partial or skewed or, or so on. It's important that we understand this. Vipassana is, I remember many, many years ago, a monk, um, I think in a Pali lesson, he was, we were talking about Pali words, and he mentioned the word, someone mentioned the word vipassana and where it comes from, and he said, this word isn't found in the in the Tipitaka. This was a scholarly, well, well-versed well monk, and I was quite surprised to hear it. The word vipassana does appear in the Tipitaka, but I think what he meant is that it's not, the vipassana meditation isn't described in the Tipitaka. And nonetheless, there's, there's some very good quotes that help us understand vipassana. What is it that we're doing here when we come to practice meditation? What are we practicing? Very much in the, in the Tipitaka means, which means in the closest thing we have to the actual teachings of the Buddha, what we, what we are told and what we tend to believe are actual direct teachings handed down that were given by the Buddha. So the most important one, there are several, but the most important one is, uh, it doesn't actually mention the word vipassana, but it, it uses the words uh, seize with wisdom. So vipassana, passana means seeing, vi, the, the prefix vi, this is the question, what does it mean? But we have a very good example of what it means when the Buddha says panyaya pasati sees with wisdom when one sees with wisdom the we it just means wisdom the Buddha says we see th we see three things with wisdom when we practice vipassana meditation what are we trying to see and the Buddha said sabbe sankara anicca all formations are impermanent. <laughs> that looks like the sound is cutting out in Second Life, which is probably just a... Uh, problem with that. Anyway, sorry for the interruption. It's impermanent, right? Everything is impermanent. Sabe sankara anicca, all formations are impermanent. So we come to see through our practice that uh, reality is not made up of things, people, places, things, these are all concepts. And they arise and cease in the mind, but they arise and cease momentarily. And reality is just made up of moments. Sabbe sankara dukkha. All formations are dukkha. Which is, is it's something we have to hedge and sort of explain grudgingly because it's 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 too harsh if you just say, oh, all formations are suffering. And we'll think, well, that's kind of a dreary outlook. And it's not really what is meant. Again, these are qualities of things. Dukkha means, it really means in relation to us, they can't make us happy and they cause us suffering. They're not suffering in themselves, but they cause us suffering. Or they are... Uh, capable of only providing suffering. Just like if you have a drink and you say it's poisonous. Well, the drink sitting there is not poison. It's not going to kill you. But it's poisonous in relation to us if we drink it. So all formations are dukkha. means uh, when you cling to them, when you take them on, this is me, this is mine, and so on. When you seek them out, you suffer. They are unsatisfying, they are not happiness. They themselves cannot be a source of your happiness. Uh, 
And finally, sabe, sabe dhamma anatta, all, all dhammas, formations and all realities really are non-self. Means they have no lasting self. They, they arise and they cease momentarily. Oh, well, that's not even true of all, all dhammas. But the point is, there is no self. There is nothing in them that arises, or nothing arisen. Um, that they are not the self. They are not ours. They, they are not under our control. They don't belong to us. They are not me. They are not mine. But again, this is not um, this is not theory, but this is how a meditator experiences reality. So, impermanence. Everything will be chaotic when you start to practice. It will it will shake you up. This meditation will not be a comfortable thing, at least not in the beginning, as it forces you to experience this reality, to not have anything to cling to. How can you survive if you have nothing to hold on to? This is the challenge. We're so accustomed to holding on to fixing in our mind, this is what I'm aiming for, this is my goal, this is what I want. And that keeps us stable. Suffering, but stable. When you let go of it, how do you live? How do you find peace? How do you be at peace? It's not easy. Uh, so you see the suffering, impermanence, you see suffering, the stress of, of things, and you see how when you do hold on to anything, this is stressful, watching as things arise and cease, things that you hold on to, may it stay, may it stay, they disappear. Things you worry about, may they not come, may they not come, and then they come. And as you can't control, you're not in charge. Another important aspect of vipassana is the present moment. So another important quote that we have of the Buddha where he, is where he says, Pachupanancha yo dhammang tatha tatha vipassati. Vipassati is just another form of the word vipassana. It's the same exact word. Vipassati is the verb, vipassana is the noun. So one sees clearly everything that arises in the present moment. Whatever dhammas arise in the present moment, one sees them clearly. <laughs> and the point here being, you know, sees clearly impermanent suffering, non-self, and sees the three characteristics. But the important thing is here and now. Meditation isn't about the future. It's not about a goal that you're striving for. It's not about the past, who you've become and who you are. It's about seeing reality, which is only in the present moment, and it's only in our experience. It's not in the world out there, or in who we are as our being. It's not in our relationships with other people. Reality is in the experience, moment to moment. So we come to see impermanent suffering, non-self, in our experiences. Seeing that any time we cling to anything, we suffer. That reality is not meant to be clung to. There's no benefit from clinging or uh, identifying with things. We see all this for ourselves. This is what it means, vipassana dura. This is the great duty that we're, the great task that we're undertaking. And this is how we carry on the Buddhist tradition. This is how we carry on his traditions that are, have been handed down century after century. We continue through our patience, through our care. We continue to care for the Buddhist teaching and pass it on and keep it pure and keep it alive. And so I'd like to express my appreciation for everyone for doing this, for taking up the study of the Buddhist teaching, even if it just means listening to talks, and most especially for taking up, like this old monk, well, at the very least, we take up meditation, which is still a perfectly valid way of carrying on the Buddhist tradition. 
because it's only when we understand the teachings that we can really and truly pass them on. So there you go. There's the Dhamma for tonight. Thank you all for tuning in. And wish you all good practice. <laughs>